so I think it's it's time, <laughs> as uh, time is running fast. So uh, I will introduce myself. I'm Olivier Husson. I'm a French agronomist by training. I did my PhD in, uh, in the Netherlands. I'm working for a French research organization, governmental organization, doing applied research for the tropics, research for agricultural agronomic research for development in the tropics. So I'm, I've been working for 10 years in Vietnam, 10 years in Madagascar, and five years in West Africa, plus missions in about 50 countries. So um, I'm, I was working mainly on, uh, let's say, designing a regenerative agriculture cropping system with farmer, about everywhere in the world with different climates. Um, so uh, in the past 10 years, we were looking for some indicators of soil health that could be used to, to see if we were on the right tracks when we were designing cropping system. And uh, I thought that, in fact, uh, I, I used to work, I did my PhD in, uh, in Vietnam on acid sulfate soil. It's soil that when they oxidize, they acidify. So I used to work on redox potential at that time in the paddy field. And then I thought, why? Redox potential is important in paddy field, but not in uh, aerobic uh, crops. So I started and uh, I wrote this paper, a review paper, so seven years ago. And then I've been working on this. It was based on a literature review, more than 20 disciplines, based on 800 articles. And I think in my computer at the moment, I have about 5,000 articles that all converge to to say that it works how I'm going to present it today. So it's solid. <laughs> uh, and in the past, I think the, this, these five papers are in the past uh, three years. So we have been moving quite fast and I have another five or six papers to finish uh, this year. So um, the idea is that when you cannot solve a problem, it's often because you don't look at it in the right way. So uh, let's say we look at this cylinder, and if we always look at it like that, we see something, something square. Okay? Let's say it's the pH. pH is a master variable in, in agronomy. So let's say we were used to look at it that way. And if you really want to understand, you have to, to change your perspective and to add a dimension to your system look at it. So this will be EH, the redox potential. So I don't know who's familiar with redox potential. Okay. Who never heard about who never heard about it? <laughs> so it's as usual, a majority. And who heard about it but never understood? <laughs> so who thinks he understood? Yeah, those those few ones, good. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if we can move on, I don't know, yeah. So we were just going to add the dimension then to, to broaden our conceptual framework. But of course, if I say now everything is regulated by, by EH, it's not pH anymore, who's right? <laughs> it's pH or it's EH? No, in fact, it's both, and we will look at both of them at the same time. It's one parameter we can just call, we can, can calculate from both. It's the electronic potential plus the hydrogen potential. So redox chemistry can be presented in a very ugly way with formulas and nobody would understand. We will make it as simple as, as possible. We have water, life is in water, we put water in the middle. Water gaining protons, it's acidification. Okay? Water losing protons makes H2O minus H plus, it's OH minus, it's alkalinization. So we have the pH axis, the X axis. We're just going to add another ax like this. We, we say that water gaining electron it's a reduction, it's accumulation of energy. When you accumulate electrons, you accumulate energy. 
The opposite, water losing electron, it's oxidation. And uh, that's what we call the redox cross. It's simple. This axis, it's the redox potential. And we measure difference in, in, in voltage. It's in millivolts, usually. And that's it. In fact, all you need to know more than this is that naturally, water losing electron is making oxygen plus proton. So we move naturally on this kind of slope because it's, life is in water. So globally, what will be important is the distance from this slope. And we, the, the mean slope is 59 millivolts per pH unit. And we can calculate this. It's PE plus pH. It's the distance from this slope, in fact. So that's about all you need to know to understand all what I'm going to say now. Okay? So I cannot make redox chemistry more simple. <laughs> okay? And uh, it's... It's, I'm already at the edge. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good. Last thing you need to know, P plus pH equal 14 would be the neutrality. So uh, the neutral, electric neutrality is at EH 410 millivolt at pH 7. And this is P plus pH 14. So the line like this, P plus pH 14, will be the neutral, the electric neutrality. Okay. That's it. I think everybody can follow. It's, uh, it's difficult to make it more. Sorry, you have the answer. What kind of reaction can do this? Where we will accumulate energy, we accumulate proton and electron when we go this way. So which reaction can do this? And that we, most of you use every day or live from it. It's photosynthesis, yes. So photosynthesis is acidification and reduction. So we accumulate proton and electrons, so we accumulate a lot of energy. Other reduction reaction are proto proteosynthesis, liposynthesis, we just accumulate energy and energy. Okay? So redox potential will go down. The lower the redox potential, the, the highest the energy level. It's like for pH, the lower the pH, the higher the proton number. So, um, that's it, in fact. So from all the papers I quoted before, I'm just trying to show you in one hour and a half, it's a challenge, that EH, pH have a very high importance, very strong impact on soil, on plant nutrition, on plant growth. Then the soil directly has an impact on plant EH, pH. Plants have an impact on soil EH, pH, because they bring the energy to the soil. And then the EH, pH level in the plants will determine plant health, in fact, the, the, the disease or not. Reversely, pest and disease will impact plant EH, pH. And then through the practices, we can impact the soil, the nutrition, the plant directly. And we will go to the animals also because the food going to the animals, will Im the quality of the food that we can read through EH, pH, will impact the, the health and the growth of the animals. And in return, what we, when we return the manure from, to the soil, we have an impact of the animals on the soil. So you see many loops, many interacting parameters. So with the same I think we will look at all this, but behind all this, we have microorganisms. Okay. They play an important role at all levels. And then it's an excellent criteria to use. It's a very good indicator for in a one health approach. We can assess the health of soil, plants, animals with the same grid of, 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 of reading, of, uh, with the same perspective all the time. Water is everywhere because EH, pH, water is just <laughs> at the basement. There's no EH, pH without water. It's, uh, it's electron, proton, it's all, all coming from there. Um, last thing before starting, really, all, 
I'm going to say is not new. Uh, it was called Bioelectronic by Louis Claude Vincent. It was a French hydrologist who developed this 70 years, more than 70 years ago. It was used for, for human health. Okay, so we just adapt something from human health to plants, soil, animals. But we are at the basic, at the fundament, for really at the lowest level of the physics, the chemistry, proton, electrons. And we will see we can go up to the planet level with the greenhouse gas emissions. So, so we are rooted into the process at the very finest level and move up to the, to the scale from this to the to, to higher level. So we, from the publication I've shown you the seven years ago, we can say it works like this. We have a conceptual model. In fact, all living organism needs to sustain a good, a proper EH, pH level at the cell level. Uh, it's just a matter of energy. It's the, using the energy. It's in the mitochondria, mitochondria, the use of energy. It's done at a given EH, pH level. Okay, so at cell level, it, they must sustain, all living organisms must sustain this level. The problem for plants, EH, pH in the soil, are fluctuating a lot. We will see how much. So, in, in addition, all the biotic stresses and abiotic stresses are trans translated in the plant as oxidative stress. So, they will impact the plant. Oh. So, I have a problem with this, maybe I'm not there. So, there are some processes for regulation. There's some buffering for redox, we say poison. I don't know why, <laughs> but when I will say poison, it's buffering for redox. Uh, so it's some molecules that can give or accept electron and proton to, to sustain the, the proper level. So it's regulation and in the short term. When this capacity are over, overpass, there's it's redox level, redox signal that activates the genes and the, it's a transcription. It's, the, the plant will form proteins to adjust the level. And there's compartmentation. All the different organelles will be at different levels. Uh, the, the chloroplast, where you have photosynthesis, are at a very low level. The, the nucleus is, is kept only at low level, at rather low level, on minus 500 millivolts. Otherwise, you have destruction of the DNA. Uh, mitochondria are a little bit higher. And the vacuoles have a higher level. And the, the extracellular space is at the highest level. In fact, what, happen, what happens is that the plant, when the cell, when the, the, it's too acidic to oxidize, it just expels in the extracellular space the acidic and the end product of, uh, of ox oxidation, the very oxidized molecules. So just to sustain the cell level, just evacuate in the, in the, in the cell walls mainly. So it's fundamental because it's where we will have the war for, for redox level in the cell walls with the, the pathogens. Sorry, I said pathogens. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the main process to sustain the, the homeostasis at the, the cell level is in the plant. The plant will sustain the rhizosphere at the proper level. So it will take product from photosynthesis and release them in the roots. This will correct EH, pH, and it will favor specific microorganisms that will, the, 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 the sugar also from the roots will feed this microorganism. And this microorganism, they have very strong ability to, to regulate the EH, pH of the environment. So the plant will correct directly EH, pH, which will make some specific microorganisms thrive, and they will correct again. At the same time, the EH, pH in the rhizosphere largely de determine the population of the microorganism. Okay. We will see that EH, pH in the rhizosphere will determine the solubility, the form of the elements, so their solubility of all the nutrients, but also all the, the heavy metals. And Deficiencies or, or, or toxicities will impact plant EHPH. It's, it's another oxidative stress. 
Then in the long run, you have organic matter. You have, you have biomass coming back to the soil. It makes organic matter. And the, the organic matter is what will lower and buffer the, the EHPH in the soil. But in, this, in, in another loop, the EHPH in the soil will impact the speed of mineralization. The more oxidized, the faster the oxidation. So it's a, another loop coming here. Okay. Uh, where am I? Then the organic matter will also buffer the, the EHPH or limit the fluctuations. Earthworms were there. They are very important in the soil. So what hap happens when we have very low redox? It's mainly paddy fields, waterlogged conditions, pit soils. So it's when there's water saturating the soil. In fact, only the plants that are able to pump oxygen in the rhizosphere to raise redox level in the rhizosphere will survive. For the crops, it's rice. There's no other one. So it's, it's simple. I've been working all my career on rice, so that's easy. To, to. It's a very interesting plant because it can be grown in very low level in paddy field, but it can be grown in upland condition like, like wheat. So uh, we have all kinds, huge range of EHPH. So to study these processes, it's, uh, it's interesting. So the, 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 the rice or the, 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 the plant able to pump oxygen will raise EHPH in the rhizosphere. But the nutrients, the plant will absorb rather unbalanced nutrients because it's reduced. It can, you can have toxicities with iron, with arsenic at low level. So the plant is losing its capacity to reoxidize. You can have bacteria that start developing at, the, at this level. So the capacity to reoxidize is diminishing. So EHPH in the rhizosphere is going down. And then you have anaerobic bacteria that, have, that comes in. And that you, they will make the redox in the soil go down further. They don't like oxygen at all, so they, they just make the, the level go down. So in the soil is going down, and in the long run you have biomass coming, but you don't have humification because you don't have the fungi, the bacteria that can do this. It's too low redox for them. So organic matter is just accumulating, but there's no evolution in it, and you can go down again, and you can have methane toxicity, H2S toxicity, it's fermentation. So in fact, you don't, there's plenty of energy, but there's no oxygen to use it. We, we, we will look at all the, the minerals after, not all of them, but we will, we will see how it works. Also, there's no mineralization, so nutrition is impaired, so it's a, it's a problem. And a plant, the, the, main, the main form of mineral nitrogen in this condition, it's NH4+. Plus. And a plant absorbing ammonium releases H plus to sustain the electric charge. So it's acidify, acidifying the, the rhizosphere. And this solubilizes aluminum. You can have aluminum toxicity. Okay? So you see everything is linked all the time. Um, and then you can have N2O emission and methane emission, so greenhouse gas emission are favored by, uh, there's a peak of emission at, at zero millivolts around, so very low redox. The neutral is 400, zero is already very low. Okay. The opposite, when the soil is too oxidized, what happens is that the plant, to correct, will pump product from the photosynthesis to feed the microorganism in the soil. So this they will feed the microflora to reduce EH, pH, or to, to reduce EH in the soil, at least. But the, the product of the photosynthesis they use to do this, they cannot use it to make new leaves. And the new leaves are the capacity to make reduction. Photosynthesis is the fundamental reduction, the primary reduction. So the capacity of reduction is not increasing. Okay? The plants will absorb mainly nitrates, because in very oxidized condition, the mineral form is, is nitrate. And to, to use nitrate, the plant will need to reduce it in ammonium, then to reduce it in proteins. And to do this, it will use product of the photosynthesis. And this product of the photosynthesis are not available to make new leaves. So the growth is really slow. You can lose nitrates. They are very 
mobile in, in the soil, so it's pollution, it's, uh, it's loss of money also for farmer. At high level, IVH level, you can have cadmium, leads, uh, toxicity, they become solu soluble. And we will see that this IVH level will favor the development of insects, fungi, nematodes, uh, viruses. So the plant will be attacked. It's another oxid oxidative stress. It's getting more and more oxidized. The capacity to produce leaves is not increasing. And at the end, you have limited amount of biomass coming back to a soil with very strong oxidation levels, so very fast mineralization. So this fast mineralization make, makes that you lose organic matter. You don't produce more, so you mineralize. And then EH, pH, especially EH, is raising. And you're getting more and more oxidized, and the next year, it's just worse. The plant needs to spend more energy to, come to adjust in the soil. Okay? So you see the vicious circle. The good point is that when it's working at proper level, what's happening? The plant will release some product of the photosynthesis to feed microorganisms, and especially it will be the, the mycorrhizae. It's just outsourcing the prospection of nutrients. It's, it costs less for the plant to have plenty of very fine uh, ivy, uh, better than having big roots that explore uh, limited uh, volume of soil. So there will always be some for this, but most of the products are used to make new leaves, and then the plant is growing quite well. The, the mineral form, when we are in mineral form of nitrogen, is both ammonium and nitrates. So the plant will absorb both. There's no, we will see the, the impact. It's better. There's no toxicities with heavy metals or different product. And this plant, they are not, the insect will not be attracted at all. And the, 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 we will see why fungi, virus, they cannot develop on such plants. Okay. So you produce quite a lot. Then you have a lot of biomass coming back to your soil. And one part is mineralized. You have a balanced redox, so one part is mineralized, one part is humified, and you increase your organic matter content, and you buffer the soil EH, pH at the proper level. So you see, this is what we aim at with regenerative agriculture, that we, we function at, at, at this level. Earthworms are fundamental, and I should have it somewhere. <laughs> Animals. In fact, we'll see that in the rumen, of a cow, you have a transformation of organic matter that you don't have in, in the soil naturally. And it's, it produces the, the, the dungs of the cow are very reduced. It's balanced pH and very reduced EH, so around zero. So it's, it's full of energy and it's excellent for the, for the soil. So we will see all this. So soil EH and pH. We, we measure it with this kind of electrodes. Uh, this is in, in Côte d'Ivoire. The organic matter, we will see that is the first loop. EHPH regulates the speed and the intensity of mineralization and humification process. So, and we have very rapid degradation of organic matter when we are at high EH, so in oxidized soil. On the other side, in fact, not on the right place, maybe. <laughs> uh, the, the organic matter is the reservoir of electrons. So it will be where electrons are accumulated, especially the microbially accessible uh, carbon is, is the reservoir of electrons. So it lowers the redox potential, and it poises, it, it, it buffers the redox potential. And for pH, it's, uh, it moves towards lightly acidic to, to neutral. So the quantity and the quality of the organic matter will impact soil EH, pH, and their fluctuations. So we have a first loop. The microorganism, each microorganism is adapted to specific EH, pH conditions. So some are more ubiquitous than other ones, so they can have a wider range. But most of them, they are adapted for specific EH-PH condition. It's linked to their metabolism, eh, mainly. So, soil EH-PH is a major driver of the population of microorganisms. It will really determine, determine what kind of microorganism you, you will get. 
And in the other way around, the microorganisms, they have very, very high ability to alter EHPH in their environment through the, the biofilms. They, they are too small to control internally their, their EHPH, so they're controlled by the population, by the biofilms. And they have very, very strong ability to, to, to do so. And basically, the respiration consumes oxygen, so it lowers the redox potential. Okay, so uh, microbial activity is accumulation of energy in the soil. So besides organic matter and biological activity, what's important, what will impact soil EHPH, it's clay. You need some clay in the soil, and especially be the, the iron in the clay. Iron can give or take one electron, so it will buffer the, the, the redox level. Sulfur can take or give eight electrons, so it does less sulfur than iron in the soil, but it has the ability to, to control, to, to, to use eight electrons of a lot of energy, so it's uh, another important parameter. But first of all, it's water and hair that will determine EH and pH in the soil. You need organic matter, you need carbon, but uh, biological activity, yeah? Uh, phosphorus, the impact in itself, it's, it's not on EH, it's more on pH. The, it's, phosphorus is the only the nutrients that the, the form will de depend on pH only. But the solubility, the availability, the solubility of phosphorus is indirectly linked to, to EH because EH will uh, solubilize aluminum, uh, calcium, different things that, that will block the phosphorus. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's a problem. So, in fact, if, if, if it's water and air in the, in the soil, what's happening is that as soon as you have... The, the, the redox chemistry in paddy field is very well known. Uh, it's submersion and redox is dropping very fast. pH is raising a, a little bit. But as soon as you have saturation, water saturation or submersion, EH is dropping. Uh, this, the, the redox chemistry, it's, it's more than, it, it's, it's 50 years old. We know this very well since more than 50 years. Um, so water logging, it's really this, dropping the, the EH and raising the, the pH. In aerobic soil, there's almost, there was five years ago, almost no, no study. The only kind of things we could find is this kind of things, where we have the water table, so it's so semi-aerobic, in fact. And what we see is that EH, when it's dry, you have the rainfall here. EH, when it's dry, EH raises, and then some rain it drops, and then drying, it's high, and then drops with the rains, and then drying. So you see how variable it is. This is 600 millivolt, this is minus 200 millivolt. Okay, so it's... 800 millivolt difference within a few days. To give you an idea, do you, when, when they, they monitor your heart, when you, 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 you pass a heart uh, electro, electrocardiogram, okay? do you know what's the, the voltage difference between the peak and the, the, low, the lowest part? Of, uh, do you have an idea? It's two to three millivolt. Okay? So we, here we are talking about 800 millivolt. To give you an idea, in, in, uh, in fish ponds, young fishes, 60 millivolts raise, you kill the fish. Okay, for young fishes. So that's huge fluctuation. So it's extremely variable in space and time. So that's one of the difficulty for, of the measurement. But we needed to understand this. So globally, how it works? It's, there's no thermodynamic equilibrium in soil. It's always fluctuating. So don't expect to have a medium level, all the soil at the same level, perfect. First, this would be a disaster, because that would mean no bio biodiversity. That would mean no, no uh, possibility to exchange energy. If all the energy at the same level, nothing is functioning, because there's no way to exchange the energy. So in a soil, in an aggregate, you can have 
in a one millimeter aggregate, you can have more than 200 millivolts difference when it's drying or when it's getting wet. But globally, what sustain an average level of the soil at the correct level, around 400 millivolt, it's organic matter and biological activity, and it also it will buffer at this level. As soon as you have water saturation, water logging, globally everything drops. So of course there's still some differences in redox, and roots can reoxidize. Some, but globally we go at too low level, and drying we will see it's a little bit complicated. But globally it will oxidize the soil. Okay, so. We are in kind of, so of course some will be still more reduced, but globally the soil will be more oxidized. So we need really to understand in a dynamic and uh, with oscillation in time and space. So I have no time to show you some reactions that are interesting, but it's always fluctuating and it's extremely variable in, in space, especially at the aggregate level. But globally, if you have low organic matter content, low biological activity, low clay content, usually you have a poor soil structure. This leads to very low poisoning capacity. So when it's raining, it's going down very fast. When it's drying, going up to high level and drying. So it's fluctuating all the time. It's a nightmare for a plant to adapt to this. It's almost impossible. Okay? The opposite, if you have organic matter, biological activity, good structure, some clay, then for the same climatic uh, hazard, you will buffer the, the, the fluctuation, and the plant will have a long time window in favorable conditions. So the level is important, but the buffering capacity is very important. You cannot just say it's average level is good. If you spend half the time here and half the time here, the average level is good, but uh, the result is a disaster. So the key is the soil structure. If you don't have a good soil structure, the plant will face terrible fluctuation of pH and EH. Within a season, pH can vary for of more than two pH units, even within a few weeks. So pH is also very, very variable. But for me, the most important, if I can do on only one analysis for a soil, I ask for the water-stable aggregates. Because if you have water-stable aggregates, to have them, you need to have organic matter, biological activity. You will have a good soil structure. And uh, just a slack test is very informative. I don't know if you know the slack test. Just put it, put some metals in water. This is conventional. This is kind of, uh, let's say, conservation agriculture. You see after three hours, there's nothing left here, just big mess. And here, there's still the structure, okay? So a good soil, the structure is, is stable. But you have to remember that soil structure, it's energy, it's sugar, it's life, it's biological activity. There's not one metallic tool that can make a good, stable structure. This is really something fundamental to understand. I think you agree on this. The structure you can have with all these microorganisms, organisms, the earthworms, it's a structure that you cannot recreate by, by mechanical tools. OK, so we made about <laughs> oh yeah, some, some tens of thousands of measurements to understand how it was really working in the soil globally, the, the average level. It's very linked to humidity. So if you have the wiltering point, the fill capacity, saturation, and submersion, what was difficult to understand for an agronomist is that, especially I was working in paddy field, for me, when you raise humidity, you, especially when you have saturation, you lower the redox potential. In fact, chemically, it's, the, it's true when you are above saturation and in submersion, but when you dry your soil, if it's a dead soil, chemi the chemical aspect of the redox is that you lose water that retains oxygen, so your redox is going down. Okay? This was difficult to understand. But when I discussed with chemists, I said, huh, what did you expect? The opposite would be surprising. So, sorry. <laughs> 
But biologically, when you have living soil, in fact, when you, raise, when you decrease humidity, you decrease the biological activity. And biological activity it is what decreases the redox. So you raise the redox. Okay? So you have two opposite uh, factors that are playing at the same time. So globally, a living soil will be like this. It can be a little bit more oxidized. The perfect soil would be something like this. And this is something tricky. If you measure, let's say you measure soils here, you don't see any differences. You have the same redox potential for all of them. The difference is that, OK, uh, the, pr the problem here, it's not redox potential or anything else. It's water. There's no water for the plant. No need to discuss to measure redox or anything. There's no water. There's no water. End of the talk. You add water, and then we can discuss. Okay? Redox potential, pH, it will be interesting at higher level. But it's, it's what happened to us in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, we, we compared the same day some conventional system with plowing dead soil and some regenerative agriculture. And we measure regenerative agriculture was here, and dead soil was here. So when you read just the redox, it's the same. What's good. It's not so interesting. In fact, this one, the plant has water. This one, the plant has no water. But the key word is the soil structure and the water. So it's the first thing to, to help. Now, what's the impact of this on, uh, on nutrient solubility and on plant nutrition? So what we are used to, this is just something I took to, two days ago on uh, the University of California website, is that in soil chemistry, pH is the master variable. So this gives you the, the, the solubility, the availability of the different nutrients according to pH. Okay? You have other ones a little bit more sophisticated, but globally it tells you that uh, for iron, for instance, below six iron is pH six iron is available, and at pH four point five, iron is extremely soluble. You can have toxicities. In fact, sorry, the reality is this: <laughs> these are. This is classical thermodynamics. It's, it's uh, more than 70 years old also. It gives you the stable form of an element as a function of pH and EH. Okay? And for iron, in that case, the soluble form is the uh, ferrous iron. Uh, iron. Okay? So it's this green part. So take this point, pH 6. But there's no iron because this, this, these forms are not soluble, so the plant cannot access them. Okay? So in fact, a plant, when it faces this kind of condition, it, tr it tries to, in the rhizosphere to acidify or to reduce different possibilities. In fact, it does both. And there's, there are measurements for this. Here, you have roots with iron and without iron. And the color here it shows that the plant releases some uh, iron reductase. So it's a nice, an enzyme that will reduce iron to make it soluble. On the other side, ooh, it's not very clear, you have uh, the pH without iron, with iron. Okay, so pH is going down quite a lot. So the plant is really controlling EH and pH in the rhizosphere to solubilize the, the element. If you are very low like this, you can have toxicities. It's a, it's a problem. And only plant like rice will try to reoxidize them as much as possible. And you will see a ferric iron uh, gain around the roots in that case, a brown gain around the roots. So, this is very recent. It's a PhD that has been defended two, two months ago in, in France, in Toulouse. Um, we have some soil. It's the same pH, EH. We have the limit between Fe2 plus and FeOH3. And we, we have different water management in the same soil. And we monitor every day EH and pH. 
And what we see is that here we have the soluble iron in the water solution. Okay? So what we see is that this red, where it's always above the, the limit, we started measuring only after 15 days, so we were here already, there's no iron in the salt solution. The blue one here, it's oxidized at the beginning. It goes down, down, down. And on day 44, it goes, it, it, it crosses the limits. And we see day 44. Here we are for day 44, it starts. And you see that iron is getting soluble. soluble. Okay. And we have exactly the same for manganese. Manganese, the limit is a little bit higher. But what we see is that the red one, there's a lot of manganese in the salt solution. The, at the beginning, then when it crosses the limits, the manganese is not soluble anymore. And for the blue one, it's the opposite. It starts from there. There's no manganese when it's there. And it goes down here. And then you have manganese soluble. And to show you that it's not the difference of total manganese, we measured the last days. That means here, 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 and here. We measured the total manganese. It's exactly the same in the soil. But the soluble, the, the soluble manganese in the, in the salt solution, when you're here, it's high. When you're here, 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 it's almost near. So you can have plenty of manganese in your soil. If the soil is oxidized, the plant will not get it. Okay? And <laughs> John is laughing because he knows what deficiency in manganese makes. It, it blocks the, 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 the photosynthesis, so nothing in the plant will work well. Okay, so for nitrogen, you can think nitrate and ammonium both are soluble, so we don't care. The plant can access both of them. First thing I like to say is that for nitrogen, it's really a matter of PE plus pH. You see the limit. It's not only pH or redox. It's really PE plus pH that will determine the form of nitrogen, of mineral nitrogen. So both are soluble, but, 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 the form of nitrogen will strongly impact the plant physiology. So I said it, a plant absorbing ammonium will release H+. Plus. A plant absorbing nitrates will release OH-. minus. It's a matter of maintaining the electric charge, but this will change the rhizospheric pH, okay? And the change can be extremely important. This is a split root experiment here. That means it's the same plant, but we separate it. On the left, it's nitrate. And on the right, it's ammonium. You see the pH? You have three pH unit difference between the two. It's huge. This is about the same here. There's nitrification inhibitor. So that means there's no nitrates here, and there's nitrates here. You have the same pH difference. And nitrogen, it represents 80% of the ions absorbed from the soil. So that means it has a huge impact on rice rhizosphere, on, rice, on plant rhizosphere. So I'm too much on rice. So it will impact the solubility of all the other ions. Okay. Then a root, it's negatively charged globally. Uh, it's full of energy as compared to the soil, it's negative. So for all the, the positive ions, all the cations, you cr there's a, a, an electric force that will attract them. So the, the absorption will be mainly passive way. The problem with nitrate is that it's negative charge, so you have a repellent force. So the plant needs to actively pump the, the, the nitrate. And you can see it on the root respiration. It's increased by 10 to 15 percent when the plant absorbs nitrates instead of or, uh, uh, better than, than ammonium. There's one part to absorb. One part is transformed directly in the root. So the, the, the result, it, it will increase soil pH. On, on alkaline soil, it's not good. But then I said the plant will need to transform the nitrates into ammonium, then into proteins. And from nitrates to ammonium, it's eight electrons. It's a lot of energy. So you see it, it's 15% of its energy that is spent for that. Then to transform nitrate into ammonium, the plant will need a lot of water. 
because it will take H plus from the water and then release OH minus. And for each N, it will need four water molecules. So that means that if you have plenty of water, it's good because the plants will absorb plenty of water, so the cell will, be, will grow very fast. There's a pressure that, that will them, them grow. But in case of water shortage, in, in rice, for instance, we decrease the water efficiency up to 50%. So 10 plus 15 plus 50, 75%, it's... it's um, and we all know the, the, the nitrite-rich plants, it's not good for health. We don't like to, uh, to eat too much nitrate. But it's not all black or white. The, the ammonium has also some problems. Absorption of ammonium, it's antagonist to calcium and magnesium and other ions. So you can create a calcium deficiency because there's only ammonium in your soil. We decrease soil pH, so this will be bad for acid soil. We've seen that we can solubilize aluminum. And high ammonium level in the plant, it's toxic for the plant. So it's not good neither to have too much ammonium. The other problem is that ammonium is not mobile. So to absorb it, we say it's, uh, it's uh, just an electric force. It's passive. But in fact, the plant needs to prospect much more, so, to, so to, to have more roots or more mycelium, more IFA from a mycorrhiza. So it's, a, it's an energetic cost. We said the, NH, the, release, the absorption of NH4 plus will acidify the, the rhizosphere, but in fact, it's alkalinized the, the, the plant. And the same for nitrate, it will acidify the plant. And we will see this, can, this creates imbalance in the plant, and that's not good. So the result is that when you give the choice to a plant between nitrate and ammonium, all the plants, they will absorb a mix of, of both forms because they will, it will create less imbalance in the, uh, in the plant. Some plants like wheat or corn, they will absorb more nitrate than ammonium. Plants like rice, like soybean, they will absorb more ammonium than nitrate. In the young stage, they will absorb more ammonium than nitrates. We'll see why. Uh, at low temperature, it will be more ammonium. The, be, below 13 degrees Celsius, absorption of nitrates is also almost nil. But it's raising up to 35 degrees Celsius. The, absorption, the maximum nitrate absorption is at 35 degrees Celsius. So it's... It's linked to temperature, and this linked to temperature is linked also to the, to the pH. Vegetable? It, it's for all plants, yeah. What I'm always saying, yeah, globally, it's the same. All plants will absorb a mixture. The different vegetable, I cannot tell you exactly. I send you the paper. There's a nice review paper explaining all this. But uh, globally, if you have only nitrates or only ammonium, or only ammonium, both are bad. You need a mixture of both of them. And if you look back at the, the P plus pH, it's just around the neutral. If you look at the nitrate and the ammonium form, it's just, just around 400 millivolt at pH 7. It's this P plus pH 14 is the limit between nitrogen and ammonium. So it's, the, it's at this level that the plant will perform the best, in fact. There's also an impact on plant quality, so nitrate absorption. In fact, in vegetable, uh, with, when they have high water content, there's high nitrate content. And we know it's bad for health. For endives, for instance, if you have 30% nitrate in the solution, you have the mean friend, fresh mass head of 196 grams with only 2.4 grams of nitrogen per, per kilo, of nitrates per kilogram. You inverse, you make, make it 70% nitrate and 30% ammonium. You gain 18% in the mass, but you multiply by two and a half the nitrate content. Okay. So you can see the effect of nitrate fertilization. Amaranth, you will decrease the total flavonoid and the total phenolic content. So there's, there's information on this in the literature. But in fact, all these studies, they are bi biased because we make the assumption in all the literature that plants will absorb mineral nitrogen only. Okay. And 
we know that plants can absorb organic nitrogen. And we even know that if they have the choice, they will absorb amino acids, amino sugars, better than mineral nitrogen. Because one of, well, one of the reasons is that they, they take some molecule with energy. They don't need to reduce again and again. So first, there's a gain in energy, even if they need to absorb it actively. There's a huge gain of energy, but also you don't have the imbalance in the charge. So you don't modify the pH in the plant. So it's better for, for this. But it's extremely complicated to perform this study because you have nitrate or ammonium, it's easy to measure both. But when you say it's organic nitrogen, you have tens of uh, amino acids, you have the amino sugars, you have, then you will need to measure maybe 50 different parameters. And the, the turnover, the, the half-life of, uh, of some amino acids can be days in the soil and even hours. So it's very difficult to, to identify. And there's also the competition with the microbes. It's uh, terra incognita, all this. There's, uh, there's the publication of James White. There, there, there's plenty of things, but there's plenty of evidence that plants can absorb organic uh, thing. And then in some condition, it can be the major form of, of, uh, of uh, absorption. The problem is that most of the studies in agronomy are made in soil with 1% carbon. And 1% carbon, the main form is mineral forms. You don't have this, this uh, organic, or you, the organic form are too little. It will be the microbe who will take them first. But when you have a very, very living soil with a lot of microbes, they produce this amino acid and the plants can reabsorb them. So it's a huge gain. It's a huge difference in the, the balance for the, for the plants. And we also know that you have a, a hot spot of, earth, of uh, amino acid in the earthworm's cast. Uh, earthworm cast change completely the nutrition of the plant. And you have to know that uh, all the, the nitrogen that is passed through the earthworms is used by plants in 50 days. There's been some study with, uh, with uh, radioactive nitrogen on this. It's the impact of earthworms of the, nu the nutrition of plants, and it's mainly through amino acids, so it's, uh, it's in interesting. So the summary is easy. We can find an optimal soil EH, pH. It's a range. Also, as I, I say it again, it's not just one level with all the soil at the same level. It's an average level and it's fluctuating. But globally, if you are here, you, you won't have deficiencies or, or toxicities. But otherwise, you have plenty. You can have uh, deficiency in uh, iron, manganese at IP plus pH, molybdenum at low P plus pH, calcium, phosphorus. Phosphorus, it's indirect, I told you, it's low pH. Uh, phosphorus burn at high pH, risk of toxicity, you have these ones, plus these ones. So finally, the, the comfortable area is not so big. So it's really important to, to be most of the time in this area. Now, I like to make an analogy between animals and plant nutrition. In fact, the external environment for the plants, it's the soil, no problem. For the, for the animals, what is the external environment? There? Yeah, feed or the, the, we just, the animal, we just carry our roots inside. We invaginated the roots. It's easier to walk. And, but it's exactly the same processes, the same structure, the same function. So the digestion and the solubilization of nutrients Peristalsis, peristalsis in the, for the movement in the, in the stomach or in the, the rumen. And what makes the solubilization? It's the flora in the rumen or in the intestine. For the plants, the peristaltism is microfauna and the solubilization is microflora. Okay. For the structure and the, the, the absorption, the process, we have the digestive tracts. 
with the, villi the villis. And for the plant, we have the roots with the roots here and the mycorrhizae. Okay. So it's exactly the same. We just invaginated our roots to carry it. Then I like to ask a question. Do you imagine one minute killing your microflora regularly and be healthy? Do you imagine preventing the peristalsis? Do you think your, your digestion will be good? It's what we do with the soil. As, as soon as you plow, you kill all this. You kill the earthworms that are doing this. So you just paralyze all the digestive tract of the plant. Okay. And then you need to start again and renew it. It's not a good way to be healthy, I think. It's, uh, okay. So now in the plants, um, I will go fast. Redox signal, there are, until the year 2000, it was, pH was the key variable. Everything was regulated by pH in the plant. Since the beginning of 2000, we have publication and publication, and Redox regulates this, Redox signal, Redox, Redox. And we don't know what is not regulated by Redox anymore in a plant. Everything, everything, everything. There was a publication last year. It says the title is Nothing in Biology Makes Sense If Not in the Light of Redox Regulation. Okay, so everything is said. Problem is that we went from everything is square, pH, to everything is round, <laughs> EH. Okay, so it's a matter of P plus pH. We need to, to see both. But globally, you see it regulates everything in, uh, in the metabolism. It regulates the perception of the, 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 the environment, the temperature, the light. It regulates all the phenological cycle. So just example, but there's thousands of publication. And so it's what I was saying, nothing in biology makes sense. So we, it's a universal process. We don't know what is not regulated by this. But in fact, it's both of them, it's the interaction between the two. So the plant, they behave if, just like as if they were avoiding extreme EH and pH. So they can change the pH in the rhizosphere, not only because of, uh, of iron deficiency or things, something like this. There's possibility to, to alter the, the pH. It can be up to, sorry, two pH units in acidic condition. And all the time, it brings it back to 6.5 to 7, okay, around slightly acidic to neutral pH. For EH, we have studied in rice, very, very low redox. So you have the distance from the roots and you have the EH. So on the roots level here, it's minus 300. So the root is just around 50. We see that rice reoxidized there. When the soil is not so, so reduced, it's higher and when here it's 100 millivolts, it's already very reduced, it's a paddy field. But what we see is that the rice roots can impact redox for about four, about four milli millimeter. And that near the roots, it's around 400 millivolts. And fababin, when it's in very oxidized soil, the, the tip of the young roots, redox is around 400 millivolts. So every time the plants try to adjust the rhizosphere, pH 6.5 to 7, and uh, EH around 400 millivolt. It's the electric neutrality. It's where you will have a mixture of nitrogen and ammonium. And then in the literature, you see that rice, uh, that, that roots, the rice deposits, it's 5 to 80% of the photosynthetic production. So first question I ask myself, how nature could keep a process that costs so much? It's just because there's no choice it's the energetic metabolism. It has to function at this level. So it's not a question of I adjust more or less my EHPH and I function more or less. It's I adjust, it costs me more or less, and if I cannot pay the price, I'm dead. Okay. And first hypothesis I can make is that the more the soil is in balance, the more the plants will have to pump and to correct. And 80%, it's in a very difficult environment, in the tundra, in the very critical conditions. 5%, for me, it's when the soil is perfectly well, and that's it's just for mycorrhizae. It will not go lower, because it's just outsourcing the, the prospection. 
The second hypothesis I make is that there's, there's been a co-evolution, soil, plant, microorganism that was driven by EH, pH. And the soil, it's colonized by some, some plants that will release compounds that will activate microflora that make the soil evolve and then you know, the type of flora arise. And we see the opposite when we degrade soils. When we burn and burn, we see the evolution. The, the kind of, of plants we have is very related to EH and pH. Plants, we can find good indicators of EH, pH with plants. It depends. There's some definition that includes everything. <laughs> some is just just uh, the thing. But th this includes uh, the the dead cells, uh, the, the the active part. It's everything that goes around. Okay. Now, then, some recent study we made, we published how it works in a plant. In fact, we study in rice, so we have EH, pH, and P plus pH. We can. We can calculate EH corrected to pH 7. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. It's the distance from this average slope. Okay? What we see is that the base of the leaf, we have the base, the middle, and the tip of the leaf. The base is more oxidized and alkaline than the tip. Okay? The idea is that the leaf of rice is like this. So the tip, it's full light. The base, there's less light. So photosynthesis is higher here. So photosynthesis is higher here, acidification and, and, and reduction. Okay? So it's mainly linked to, to the, the photosynthesis. Then we have a gradient in, uh, in the plants. So in red, we have the pH. In blue, the EH. And in, in, in green, it's, let's say, P plus pH, or it's an equivalent. Um, we have three tillers of, of, uh, of rice. And what we see is that pH is going down 691, 84, 55, 34, 25. So the old leaves are more acidic than the young ones. And it's really linked to the age of the plant because this leaf has the same age of, as this one and this one. And 688, 91, 93. So it's about the same, very, very close. For redox, uh, the young leaf, in fact, there's very high redox. 65, 64, 63. So you see against the very current. It's the average of four plants every time. In fact, the photosynthesis is not, has not started fully at, uh, in the young leaves. So low photosynthesis, oxidized, plant, uh, oxidized leaves. Then the second and the third leaf, there's full photosynthesis, full light there on the top. They have the lowest redox. And then when you go down, the leaves are aging, and they have less light also, so redox is going up again. Okay. So we find this so many times. Again, it's photosynthesis that is the, the, the basement. So when we measure, we measure the middle third of the last fully developed leaf. Okay. It's what we call. For Nova crop, it's the one they ask you. And we can measure the oldest still photosynthetic leaf. It's what Novacrop is doing. Doing this, you have almost highest pH and lowest redox. And you have lowest pH and high redox in the plant. Probably, yeah. There's plenty of, uh, of implications, of, con of uh, consequences of, of this, but we don't know them. But you have a difference in, in, in potential, so you create an electric force. For all the, 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 the charged molecules, you, have, you create a force. I think so, but we, we have no proof of this. We, we, with this, we know, that, we know that we create a force. We have a difference in potential, so an electrically charged particle will, will, have, will, will face this force. And electric, electric force are extremely, extremely strong, <laughs> extremely powerful. So that, this could explain many things, but we have no, no proof. It's, this has been published uh, last year, and we've been working on this. It's really new, new result. Then we, we have EH, pH. We have rice, 40 days old. And we measure from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening, measure continuously. We are in the tropics. It's done in, in Benin. Uh, it's before sunrise. 
to after sunset, okay? And this is the light at the moment of the, of the measurement, this curve. We have three different varieties, and what we see is that redox is going down, then there's a plateau, and then it's going up, and pH is slightly going down, okay? Again, it's photosynthesis. During the night, there's been no photosynthesis, there's been some respiration, so you have high redox potential here, okay? And then, with the photosynthesis, it's good, it goes down. When I work with, with friends working with cattle, they say that's why we recommend not to cut the, the hay before 10, 11 in the morning. Because if you cut here, you have an oxidize. Yeah, so, so the bricks, there's, if we're talking about the, the grasses, for instance, the limit with the bricks is that uh, if you have a week of cloudy sky with low photosynthesis, the first day of, of sunny, the first sunny day, the bricks will not raise. The photosynthesis starts, so you, you will measure on the thing. So the hypothesis we make is that the plant did not feed the, the microbes for during the, all this uh, week with limited photosynthesis. And all the product of the photosynthesis the first day, they are just pulled down to, the, to, to feed the microbes. So this is the hypothesis. We observe that the first day, the bricks is not changing. But the, 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 this is more complicated, but it's more powerful. Tool. Then if we do the same at 20 days later, we have the same curve. The pH is going down during the day. We did this. 15 times, okay? So we have enough, we are sure it's working like this, it's, it's published. So what we see is that if we want to measure it, we, want, we need to measure during this time window, otherwise if you measure somewhere here or here, you, it's changing too fast, it's not good. What we see also is that plant EH is much lower than soil EH, we are around 250 here for rice, millivolts, I told you, Soil is around 400 when it's good. Quite often it's 600, 650. So uh, it's normal. The contrary would be a big, big disaster because the plants, they catch all the energy. So if the plants are not at a lower redox than the soil, we are just dead. It's, uh, we won't be here to discuss this. Photosynthesis, it's a reduction and acidification. And aging, it's oxidation. Photosynthesis, we see that it's going down, reduction and acidification, especially here. And aging, it's oxidation from here to, to 40 to 260 for in 20 days, and acidification. Okay. So aging, it's the same for the leaf, it's the same for the, at the plant level. Here we measure the, the last foot, uh, fully developed leaf with full photosynthesis. So if we look at PA plus pH, we see that sometimes PE plus pH is going down. Sometimes it's going up. And it's going up when there's a problem. When it's going well, photosynthesis is well, and we have acidification reduction, and, and there's more reduction than acidification. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but but in this experiment, it's made in pots. We irrigate as we want. There's all the micronutrients, all the elements. The plant is, there's all the light, all the heat. So the, the, the plant are perfectly well. We have the same in, pad, in, full, paddy field, in full field, and in plain, plain field, large field. But in large field, P plus pH is raising. And we have disease, <laughs> strangely. Uh, we also see that you have huge varietal differences. Uh, I'm going to tell you, this variety is a very, very resistant variety to, to most disease. This one is a variety that we, the breeder use because it's extremely sensitive to rice blast, the main fungi for rice. So we use it to make sure when we want to, set, to, to breed for blast resistance, we use it to infect all the, the fields. So remember this, low PA plus pH resistance, high, it's very sensitive. Okay. Uh, and globally, whatever alters the photo, 
synthesis will raise the EH and P plus pH. Okay? And we have this for corn, for copy, for cotton, for grapes, all the plants we, we did, we have it, but EH, pH is specific. Okay? So we have different one here, but every time we find the different species. Um, cassava, it's very low EH, for instance. All the solanaceae are at very high EH as compared to other plants. They are tomato, potato, they are above 320, 350. When rice is 250, okay? We don't know why solanaceae are. We find it every time. Um, but it's really specific. And then we measure at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 days. Okay, the plan. And we measure the blue one, it's in a soil which is waterlogged, so it's low redox and high pH. The brown one is in a soil with low pH, high EH. Okay. And what we see is that aging is oxidation and acidification, but the plant grown in a, at high pH has a higher pH, the plant grown as high EH has a higher EH. And aging, in fact, is much, much faster when the soil is acidic and oxidized. Okay? And you will go up to high redox level. Okay? So now, plant health. I didn't say pathogen <laughs> and disease. Uh, so this is interesting. That I told you it's, what time is it? I will be late. <laughs> anyway, I, will, I go fast. It's, it's ancient, ancient work, but for human health, he was saying that virus develop on alkaline and oxidized condition, fungi on acidic and oxidized condition, and bacteria in alkaline reduced condition. For the plants, we find exactly the same. Okay? So there's, we completely change the perspective. We said that the plant will not necessarily be attacked by an, an insect or will face the, 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 let the pathogen develop. It will be so only when the plant is imbalanced. Okay? And we can measure this imbalance through pH, redox, and we will add the electric conductivity, which is also related to, to bricks. Okay? And the idea is to say through the agricultural practice and the cropping system, we will modify EH, pH, is in the soil and in the plant to make them unfavorable for the, the development of the, the one we don't want. So we call this agroecological crop protection. The idea is to make prophylaxy, not to wait for the plant to be sick, to avoid the plant to, to, to be sick. So in petri dishes, we modify P plus pH, and we inoculate with fungi. This is rice blast. And what we see is that the inoculum is about this size. That means this, there has been no growth. It's after 14 days. And we see that the fungi has an EH, pH, and P plus pH weight, it's rise, and low, low P plus pH, it does not grow. And if we push further, it will be the same, it will not grow, okay? This it's replicates very, very well. The spoilation is very linked also to P plus pH. And we made the opposite, uh, trial is that we made petri dish with a neutral growing medium and we inoculated with 19 different fungi. So the neutral one at the, it's the beginning and the end of the, so that means the, the not inoculated, it's always here. And we measure EH, pH at the end after 20 days when the, the, the fungi have, have developed. And what we see is that sclerotinia, they are here, rice blast, Run here, Botrytis is here, and all of them, it's, it's the average of 10 points. We replicate the experiment, it's always the same areas. With the, so each pathogenic fungi has a very clear EH, pH zone where it thrives. Okay? And this is valid in Petri dish, but this is also valid on, this is on rep seed with, uh, with FOMA. Not ino inoculated, inoculated, not inoculated, inoculated. So we see there's a huge change. And the length of the cankers are correlated to the pH and the EH. Okay. So 
What we see also is that th this gradient and this dynamic in uh, rice, in plant EHPH, for rice, it's perfectly in accordance with the entry points of the different pathogens. The, the fungi, we said acidic oxidize. Pathologists, when they want to inoculate rice blast, they let the rice in dark for two days, so oxidation. And they inoculate the, the last leaf of rather old plants. It's maximum EH, minimum pH in the plant. Okay. For virus, it's alkaline oxidized. The pathologist, the same, two days in the dark, and they inoculate the base of the first leaf of young plants, maximum pH, maximum EH. The bacteria, it's not in the dark, and they inoculate the second and the third leaf of young plants. For 20 days, you, the bacteria can develop. 40 days, cannot develop. It's, again, it's the lowest EH and the highest pH. It's where bacteria thrive. So globally, we also have varietal resistance to disease. We have resistance to, 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 to bacteria, sensitive to virus, sensitive to fungi, and resistance to virus and to fungi. So we can read the, the susceptibility or the resistance of the varieties. And for insects, we, we know that the oxido reduction process are crucial, especially the antioxidants, the, the insects don't like them. As soon as you have phenols, C vitamins, especially the, the sucking insects, they don't like at all. In, in, it's a matter of, uh, of digest, di digestion. In fact, in the, in the mesenteron, it will uh, alter the EH, pH in the digestive tract of the, of the insect. And the insect, they can feel, this is for bumblebee, they can feel the electrical field more than they see the, the shape of the, or the color of the flower. So the bumblebee, it's positively charged. The pollen is negative, so when the bumblebee arrives, there's attraction. This raises the electric field of the, the flower, and the next bumblebee, they don't stop on this flower, they know the pollen is not there anymore. Okay? And I make the hypothesis, but it's strong hypothesis. I have the models behind this, but it's complicated. It's quantum physics and uh, chemistry. And it's, uh, but for me, EH, pH, and electric conductivity, they determine a frequency and an impedance. This is a radio signal. And it's really logical, because when you have pheromones with one, fer pheromone mole one molecule per cubic meter, and the butterfly can track for three kilometers, there's something else than um, mechanistic or physical. I think it's, if it becomes a radio signal, the antenna just catch the signal of the plant. And the nature had a few hundred thousand years to, uh, to adjust this, to select the antenna that catch the signal of the plant where the food is the best or where the, the, the survival of the eggs are, are the best. They develop a device for 30 years ago. It can feel one potato attacked by fusarium in a 100 kilogram bags of potato. It's an, an electrocaptor, but the, the captor they use, it's the antenna, intact antenna of uh, beetles. So <laughs> you can see that uh, there's clearly a kind of process like this. The emission of volatile substance, for me, it's the same. It's, it's at low EH, and it's probably a radio signal also. So we can have, in fact, our pH EH, we can have the map of the different pathogens. This will be necrotrophic fungi from our study we had before. The biotrophic will be there, the hemibiotrophic in between. This is for rice, lower redox, lower level for the rice blast. Then the viruses will be here, the bacteria will be here. Omicets, with, they were classified before as fungi. So for me, it was not fitting well. Why, why the omicets, it's pythium, phytophthora, plasmopara, perinospora. That means uh, mildew and pythium, basically. And for me, I could not understand why 
uh, on grapes, why the mildew was not developing in the same condition as oidium. Oidium is really in an acidic, oxidized condition, but mildew, it was, it's heavy rains and, uh, and waterlogged soils, compacted soil. And in fact, it's just because omisets, they are, mildew is not a, a fungi, it's an omisets, and omisets are close for, to algae, and brown algae, they are here, around here. Okay. So, insects will be here, basically. The adults, the herbivory, the chewing biotic will be around here. The larvae sucking around here. Nematodes will be around here. We have the map. <laughs> and uh, so we, it's called what I call the map of the redox world. So young plants that here, when if everything goes well, we have P plus pH going down. Around here, for me, we have to work on this, but for me, it's all the beneficial ones, all the pseudomonas, the, the, the trichoderma, the, the green algae, the vitamins are around here, C vitamins would be around here. So we, here there's no disease. This is where the plants will be healthy, okay? Of course, there's different between species, so it's, a, it's a broadly, but globally, if you have well-structured soil, regenerated soil, your plant will go this way, and you don't need to apply anything, and I would say you should not apply anything except reducing things, things that can help you to go there, but otherwise, you can, if you apply a fungicide, in fact, we will see, uh, will be around here, okay? So if you apply your fungicide when your plant is healthy, you can bring it to the, to the bad area. When you have heavy, heavy rains, compacted waterlogged soil, you will have bacteria or mesets. Everything that lowers the photosynthesis will bring you into this, this area. And the very oxidized, low organic matter, poly, bad soil, you can go to necroph necrotrophic back, uh, fungi. Uh, and the worst, it's the soil that are compacted within it. The plant will be from there to there to there to there to there. And fighting against bacteria, the plant, it's, the same, it's not the same uh, molecule that will fight against the necrotrophic fungi. Okay? There's antagonism in it. So the plant, this, this kind of soil is just a nightmare. Okay? So what's the reaction of the plant? When the plant is attacked, if it's biotrophic fungi, virus, omisets, and uh, this, this insect, the first part of the reaction is an oxidative burst. It kills, in fact, the plant has not enough energy to prevent the, the development of the pathogen to bring it here. So locally, it will kill the pathogen by over-oxidation. In the same time, it just kills some cells, some, it sacrifices some cells, but killing by over-oxidation. And then it sends the message to the rest of the plant to activate the, Im the immune system. It's through sal salicylic acid. For the virulence of the pathogen is the capacity to, to, count, to block this oxidative burst. For bacteria, for instance, it's uh, glutathione. Okay? And if you, when we make uh, mutant bacteria that cannot produce glutathione, the plant just gets rid of them very easily. For necrotrophic fungi, the answer is jasmonic acid and ethylene. And the, the answer of, the, of the, the, the necrotrophic fungi is through oxalic acid. Okay. So very efficient, this. The plant kills some cells through jasmonic acid and ethylene. It's programmed cell death, the decline. The, the necrotrophic just counterattack, block the attack, survives, and he has plenty of food to it because there's plenty of dead cells. So what do we do now? We have the target and we help to our plant to win the, the redox war because it's really a war for, for the redox. Uh. So this goes through regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture, living soil, call them uh, whatever you want. But this is medium term we work on the soil through the cropping system, through the, the plants we will uh, we'll have. But in the short term, we help the plants to get here. The time we have our soil regenerated, we help the plant through foliar nutrition, antioxidant, 
inoculation algae, some reducing product. Okay? And we are very cautious with this. The, we've seen that the reaction of the plant to kill a fungi is to bring it here. With the fungicide, we help the plant to do this. Fungicide are oxidizing. Almost all pesticides are oxidizing. Okay? And the efficiency of this product, it's when you are as oxidized as possible. So we develop some sprayer that inject oxygen, that make micro drops, that inject high pressure to, in fact, to bring air as much as possible, to oxidize as much as possible the fungicide. If you apply this kind of product with high pressure, you just lose most of the effect. It's tremendous, the impact you measure before in, in, in the tank of the, the sprayer and the, you spray on, a, on the uh, plastic uh, film and you measure after, it's a disaster. So this is important to, to understand. So we do it in a preventive way. We boost the photosynthesis. But if the, plant, if the, the pathogen attacks, we first help the plant to, to do this. We maybe fungicide if need be. But if we apply something that is antioxidant at that moment, we can just prevent the defense of the plant. Okay? So the idea is to keep the plant here, but if in the transition period, if you have the problem, you help the plant to go there, and after this, you correct with uh, high doses. But in any case, this agroecological crop protection, we will need regenerated soil. There's no need. If you apply all this maceration, all this uh, antioxidant product on, uh, on the dead soil, you will just get problems. Okay. Practice. Sorry, I'm too long. <laughs> In one hour and a half, it's almost impossible. Anyway, now we have the map. We know where we want to go. We just need to learn how to drive. In fact, and for me, it's just video game. Let's have fun. <laughs> the problem is that we need to, to drive like this. <laughs> the problem is that we don't know the command, and we learn why we drive at high speed. On our compacted soil, this is moving all the time. So we have to learn it's moving too fast. When we have regenerated soil, it's getting easy. But anyway, I will just make oxidizing. It's very easy. Drainage, fire, fertilizer, everything in eight, chlorate, uh, sulfate, nitrate. It's the oxidized form. Everything with chlor. There's chlorine in it. It's very oxidizing. Only urea is reducing. The pesticide, almost of all of them are there. And plowing, you inject oxygen in the soil, so it's oxidizing. But if it's much worse than this. Anyway, all this is conventional system. Conventional system, we oxidize the plant and we help the plant to kill the pathogens through over-oxidation. The problem is the plant with the photosynthesis tries to come back, and then you have again the fungi, the, the insect. So the question is, what about the sun? Oxidizing or reducing the sun? Oxidizing, reducing. So the sun on a bare soil, so the problem with plowing is that you make a bare soil. On the bare soil, you have a fenton reaction. It means the iron reacts with ultraviolet, and it produces the super, anion, super oxide anion, it's the second most oxidizing molecule okay, you can have. And this attacks the organic matter chemically, even the protected, the one which is supposed to be protected. And the lower the organic matter level in the soil, the, the higher the fenton reactions. So the sun on the bare soil, it's extremely hard oxidation. It's a loss of energy, a tremendous loss of energy. You are the plant. The, 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 the energy of the sun is the energy for the reduction. Okay? So we have free energy. Here we have strong reduction. Here we have strong oxidation. The, 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 budget, the energetic budget is easy to do. This is a disaster. This is how to improve the soil. We say bare soil, dead soil. Um, reducing. We have the sun on the plant, we have water, 
We need a good soil structure. We need the mulch, organic matter, biological activity. You can, have, you can use urea. It's always the same. <laughs> it's always the same story. The thing is that to have good soil structure, you need organic matter and biological activity. And to have organic matter and biological activity, you need plants. To have a mulch, you need plants. So we need plants. We need the leaves. And the same, it's the same for poisoning, buffering. It's the same parameter that will do this. We need the leaves. What I call this, it's another philosophy for agriculture. It's the agriculture of the science of the leaves. Okay? It's, uh, yeah. So we can see the system. It's a Nobel Prize who said life is a small electric current kept up by the sunshine. So it's just an electrical system. The leaves, it's the solar panel. The soil is the battery. Stable carbon is the compartment. Microbially, uh, microbially accessible carbon it's, and biological activity, it's the charge level of your battery. Then the, at 400 millivolts, it's well charged. Then if you raise the redox, you are losing charge in your battery. And then you can have too much. In fact, it's more like a carburetor with a lot of essence, but no oxygen. It's full of energy, but you cannot use it. Okay? And then the production is the power of your system, of your electric system. So power, it's the voltage, square voltage divided by the resistance. The, sorry, the electric conductivity, it's the opposite of the resistivity. So square voltage times electric conductivity, it's a power per distance unit, in fact, kind of, of a power. So the electric conductivity, it's what they use in precision agriculture. It's a key parameter. It's related to many parameters in the soil. It's raised with compaction, and it's raised with temperature. Okay. So if you have very low electric conductivity, you don't produce. It's empty soil. I think. If you have very high electric conductivity, you produce a lot, but you empty your battery. Okay. And I believe that we mask the decrease in, in organic matter in our soil. That means that we, the battery is getting empty, the voltage is going down. Okay. And to keep the production, we raise the electric conductivity through chemical fertilizer. And doing this, we produce a lot, but we lose more organic matter faster. And if you don't have the solar panel, you're dead. Okay? So the idea is to, ma to maximize the photosynthesis, high leaf area index, as much solar panel per, per, per unit surface. So in forest, tropical forest, it can be high. Bare soil is zero, sunflower to five to three. Rice can be 10, but just a few weeks per, per year. Uh, and this kind of thing, it's four months. This is sorghum in Madagascar, four months. I think we have system that works here. Um, so we maximize the photosynthesis. So it's the medium term strategies, everything that John is saying. <laughs> So I will go fast. Uh, and during the transition period, we help the plants. So, OK, listen to John. It's easier. It's better English. Um, so conventional, it's oxidizing practice. And we help the plant to kill the disease and the insect through ox over oxidation. But the plant tries to come back here with photosynthesis. So uh, you kill, it come back. So you just. <laughs> Use your sprayer all the time. The idea is to be here, to give the plant enough energy. When you have high pressure, very small droplets, uh, atomization, turbulence, uh, all this is injecting oxygen in the, in the droplets. So it's oxidizing your, what, what you're spraying. It's better to have it on uh, in irrigation water or things like this if you apply this. You, you need to make big drops, lowest pressure as possible. Okay. Yeah, the nozzles, the kind of the, maybe a straight nozzle, not, not the one doing turbulence, all these kind of things. Okay. This is probably why all the studies on this maceration, uh, vitamin C, all this reducing product, even probably for microorganisms, 
I think the, the, the sprayer is, can probably explain the high variability in the results. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work. I think the, one of the reasons is this, and you never get the information. See, if you don't have the, this redox perspective, you just it's, uh, don't know what you think about this. <laughs> Maybe you, you are. OK, so we are just the electrical conductivity, but there are two in the soil. So the your ionic conductivity, it's the water in the pore. It's the one they measure when you send soil samples. It's increased by chemicals, fertilization, and by temperature. And there's the bulk electrical conductivity. It's the average electrical conductivity of the soil. This one is very related to soil structure and to water. So we can do this. Then another problem with plowing is that if you reverse the soil, here we have the negative. It's the electrons are in the organic matter. So negative, positive. If you plow and you reverse, you do this. So we publish this, but you create a force for all the cations. They are repelled. You create an electric force that push them downwards. Okay. So you see the difference. Conventional, always the the top soil is more oxidized than the the subsoil. So you, we reverse, we really reverse the, the, so what's the impact on the nutrient, the base? What's the impact on plants? We don't really know. So we need to develop this knowledge, how we regenerate. We know some plants will correct pH, but we have very, very few information on this. Uh, we know, for instance, EH is higher after alfalfa wheat than sugar beet barley rotation. We know that the legumes are very useful. In the nitrogen fixation, the, the equation is this. So we need a lot of electron, of proton, of energy, but it produces ammonium and H2. So it releases the legumes, they release H2, so a lot of energy, into the soil directly. So it's extremely reducing. So for me, the, the nitrogen fixation is, is good. There's more nitrogen for the plants after, but we over, overlook completely the effect of this energy that we inject in the soil. Okay. Um, so there's almost no information. We have to do everything. John explained how oats have, has a reducing effect, but it's the only grass doing this. The solar assay is very high, but everything has to be done on this. The, the density, population density, if you, it's very densely populated, each plant has less light, so you can raise the redox and then create disease. Uh, the plant orientation for the perennials, if the, sun, if, you, if the sun is doing like this or like this, if you have your, your, your trees like this, the sun is going this way, there will be light on both sides during the day. If it's like this, only this size will have light, and, all the, and on the other side, you will have disease. It's big, big difference in the leaf in the sun and, uh, and, and not in the sun. So all this, how it works, the ketin, the ketosan, the amino sugar. Biochar, biochar, as you can have very acidic, very uh, alkaline, very reduced, very oxidized by your shy. It depends on what you're burning, how you treat it with different components before or after, at what temperature you produce it. And you see, it can be from pH 2 to pH 12, and from low, very low redox to very high redox. Okay. So if you don't know what kind of biochar you produce, if you don't know what kind of biochar you want to, to, you need in your field, just run them. OK, use biochar, and, <laughs> and we will see. So the paramagnetic basalt, the impact of paramagnetism. For me, paramagnetism is what will help the plants to have P plus pH going down. OK, it's what's. When, when you have high electric conductivity, you're going up easily. And when you have high paramagnetism, you're going left. So on, when you go up, you have the disease. When you go left, you, you don't have. So this is another very important thing. But 
Measuring EH, pH in the soil, it's useless. It's, it's varying all the time. Don't spend time on this, but measuring in the plant, it's extremely powerful. We are working on it. That's the reason why I'm here. For animals in two minutes, we can have exactly the same analogy with animals. And there are some studies, a co is about 500 ohms. And if you have more than two million pairs between the, the legs and the mouth, the co will start not drinking a lot. More than six million pairs, they are not drinking anymore. 500 millivolts, so six million pair, it's three volts. It's three volts, you have them very easily. In a, so all this electric current in the, in your, where you, you have the animals, all this, it's tremendous. 10 million pairs between the two right legs, the heartbeat is increased by 25% and the milk production goes, drops completely. Um, it's the same thing, we have imbalanced soil makes imbalanced plants make, make pests and disease. Imbalanced food, imbalanced animal, sick animals. It's the same functioning, and if you give poor food to the animals, they have all these kind of things. A diet, this is in the Rumen, it's a group in France working on this. Rich, uh, fiber-rich fiber diet, rich in stock, you create acidosis. But it's rather stable here. But if you look at redox, and your, your core is getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And then when redox in the rumen, so we, we see it's extremely low, it's minus 200. It's fermentation, it's a, a transformation of organic matter you won't have anywhere else. Uh, you, you use different concentrate feeds, you see that you raise the redox in the rumen. And it's the same, you have my, feeding your core is feeding a microbiota. You have bacteria, anaerobic fungi, protozoa, and you can have metagenic archaea, you don't want them. It's the one that producing methane, <laughs> you don't like them. But as soon as it's getting too oxidized, this one disappears, then this one. And then this one is not the same species. You don't have the one producing the fatty acids, so the, the coal has nothing to absorb. In the stomach, you have something that is not digested that, that reached the stomach, and the plant needs to control with water, with energy. It's losing fat, it's losing meat, it's losing milk. Uh, it's not reproducing well, so you have all the problems. Just to give you an idea, lactate producing bacteria, meliolytic bacteria, cellulolytic bacteria, we, we know where they are, the different ones. We know the redox level. Uh, and all these colleagues, they are vets, they measure in the water, in the soil, in the, the, the grasses, in the feed, in the blood, in the rumen, in the stomach, in the milk, in the urine, and in the, the dung. And they have the reference level, and they know which disease occurs when you raise, you raise these different parameters. So it's used in France, in farms uh, at the moment. Uh, and then the codang, it's pH 6.5, redox 0 millivolts. So you apply this in your field, it's perfect. It's transformation of organic matter, you won't have anywhere. But what we observe is it's more difficult to restore uh, the soil in a farm with no animals. When you have animals, it's easier. Bringing this, it's easier. We have higher EH is the food is of poor quality, and we can ask ourselves what is the effect of the antibiotics when you bring them back to the field. It's uh, not good. For fish and shrimps, it's the same. They use, they have the target. This is different larvae stages, so it's getting older and older. So EH, it's pH and uh, a mixture of EH and pH here and temperature here. But they see, they observe that it's going this way, in this form. If you apply microalgae, they will make photosynthesis. So this will oxidize the water. It took me a long time to understand. Because the, the algae, they will release oxygen in the water. So in water, photosynthesis is oxidizing the water. So with this, in this situation, you apply the microalgae, you bring it back, you're in the target, it's perfect. 
The next pound, you are like this. You applied, if you apply the microalgae, you just kill everything. If you don't have this kind of measurement, you can measure all the parameters you want in water, all the water quality you want. You will never understand what's happening. You're doing exactly the same thing in both ways. You have the same pH. In one time, you increase the production. And the next time, you kill everything. So it's extremely powerful. So um, then, so why, why, why we did not see this earlier for the soil? I'm not sure. Probably because EC was a decoy. We have been lured by, by this. For the plant, it's very recent in pathology. So it's quite normal. And it's extremely difficult to measure for the moment. So that's why there's this partial temporal viability. There's electromagnetic field alter the, the measurement strongly. So uh, with the electrochemical method. So that's why we're working on the on spectrometry. Um, so OK, this one, as soon as it's going wrong, everything is going wrong. The complete system gets sick if we start decreasing. The other side, if you apply properly at this level, then you just improve everything, and, and, and that's done. So yes, we can. OK, <laughs> that's the message. We can make suppressive soil. Okay, It's not uh, difficult. A healthy soil, it relies on healthy plants, on feeding the soil organism, which improves the soil structure, which feeds the plants, and then so on, you have this. We cannot grow plants without soil, but we can, sorry, we can grow plants without soil. The quality is not excellent, but we know how to do it. But there's no way we can sustain the soil without plants. Okay. This is quite often the, the opposite. So in fact, we need to have the plants feeding the soil more than the soil feeding the plants. There's no metallic tool able to, to create and stabilize the, the soil structure. And there's no need to compromise between productivity and health quality, or, or and quality, or between productivity and sustainability. It's what you find in the literature quite often. It's the opposite. To have healthy plants, you need to have highly producing plants. To have sustainability, you need to have high production. Okay? And the only thing is that you need to use the, the energy that is provided for free by the sun. So it's the leaves, the leaves, the leaves all the time. Sorry for being so long. <laughs> I've lost some of them. It, it depends a little bit on the crop, of course, but uh, the best soil, best situation for most crop is when you have a mixture, uh, when you have facultative anaerobic or aerobic bacteria that can, the one that are at the medium level, they can stand some aerobic condition for some moment, and they can thrive in uh, aerobic or the opposite. So it's the, when you have population of microorganisms that are around this 400 millivolt, and, uh, and <laughs> again, it's always, you always come back to this electric neutrality in the soil and lower level in the plants. So to have some of these microbes to lower the redox can be excellent when your soil are too oxidized. But if you have waterlogged soil, it's the opposite you need to do. If you have waterlogged soil, you need to oxidize to get back in the, the neutral area. That's the trick. It's, it's, it should not be too high, and it should not be too low. So when you're too low, you need to raise. When you're too high, you need to decrease. So, Sorry? Solution. Yeah, <laughs> there's, uh, there's not one solution. Diversity. And you need the diversity, yes. That's why you need, also in the soil structure, you will have different redox gradients, and you will have different population of microorganisms. The, the, the bacteria that do nitrification, they work only at the redox level between nitri nitrate, nitrate and nitrate. So there it's at rather high level. The one doing the, the nitrogen fixation, it's, they thrive only at very low redox level. So you need this diversity, and you, you will get it through a very well-structured soil where you have all this range of 
pH redox. The average one is good, and you have all the all the diversity of the the, the environment favorable for large, huge diversity of, of microorganisms. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, and for photosynthesis. Yeah. Globally, we are getting more and more oxidized. In fact, all the environment is getting more and more oxidizing. Yeah. Just look. Five point five. It's a fungi, you said. Yeah, fungi, it's all you acidic, and and probably rather high pH, uh, rather, rather high EH. So we are getting more and more oxidized. The electromagnetic field are oxidizing, the the pesticide are oxidizing. When we said the plants, I said it it puts all the end product of oxidation in the cell walls, but we eat the cell walls. <laughs> So uh, it's uh, we eat two oxidized food. That's why it's important to have this uh, to change all this. And w you have huge difference in, um, in redox level in tomatoes grown in uh, conventional or, or organic or biodynamic. It's even lower. So uh, that's. That's a very good tool to monitor the health from the beginning to the end. And we have all the processes explaining this. We, we understand why we have, I have no time to present, but there's all the literature explaining why the virus, I can tell you why the virus needs high pH and high EH for the right silomotel virus. It needs a high pH to be mobile in the plant, but also to swollen and to exit the RNA and to multiplicate. So it needs a high pH to do this. And it needs a high redox potential to block the immunity defense of the plant. In fact, there's a protein that the, the, the plant will recognize the virus and will send a small protein, P1, will send a signal to, to the cells to say, be careful, we are attacked by this, uh, by, by this uh, virus. So we need to reduce acidify. And the, the virus, through oxidation of this protein, the pre one, it polymerizes the protein, which becomes too, too big to enter the cell. So it blocks the signal, the defense signal of the plant through oxidation of the, 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 the signal. So we have the processes of all this. For, for the fungi, uh, there's no free oxygen in a cell. The fungi, they will arrive in the cell walls. And if there's this end products of oxidation, they will use the, the oxygen of this product and they will develop. Once they start developing, they will move the, the, the EHPH towards the optimum level. They will grow. Then the biotrophic will start penetrating uh, the cell wall, but not inside the cell completely the necrotrophic will start killing the, <laughs> the plant. So all the processes are clear. If there's not this end product of oxidation in the cell walls, the fungi cannot develop. 